everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, and today we are at the Stores Move at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. My name is Sharice and I'm one of the Education and Outreach Assistants at the Museum. And today you get a cool behind the scenes look at our storage move. So we are joined by some of the most amazing collection assistants and I'm going to pass over to them to introduce themselves to you. Hi, I'm Lily Sankweb, I'm a collections assistant on the Stores Move project. <laughs> um, I'm Katrina um, and I'm one of the collections assistants as well and um, we're going to take you around and show you a few things. Hi, I'm Annie, I'm also one of the collections assistants and I'm going to talk about our working processes at the Age of Office in the tour. Fantastic! So before we get started, can you guys tell us a bit more about what this project's all about? Yeah, yeah so the the site that we currently store a lot of bar objects in, we estimate there are about 250,000, but every single day we're finding that there are way more than we originally <laughs> planned for. Um, is not necessarily suitable for today's um, standards of storage, and it's been a long, hard fight for the museum to manage to fit out a brand new storage facility that is better suited to the objects. Um, this project involves nine collections assistants, a workshop technician, a stores move manager and a team leader um, and we all were supposed to start work in March 2020, obviously that didn't happen, um, but we're back on track now. Um, to date we've moved just over 30% of the objects that we estimate we have here and um, yeah, we're hoping to get a lot more done soon. Yeah, so as Lily said, this is one of, well, this is one of our um, off-site stores. Um, this building itself, you'll see with the high ceilings, um, used to be an aircraft hangar, um, which actually gives it its nickname, Shorts, uh, because it was a Shorts Brothers uh, manufacturing space. Um, and this means that we have a lot of height for high shelves, boxes. You'll see further down, we've got some shields hanging out upstairs as well. Um, we're going to take you down this aisle here and show you a few of the different storage solutions that we have. Thank you. <laughs> So down the wall here, you can see we've got a lot of spears. So we're calling this the spear rack. It is not ideal um, storage solution for them. We are aware of that and we're trying to change that. And when we move to the new store at the CMC, um, we'll be storing them differently. But for the moment, they're stored vertically um, with the blades <laughs> safely out of reach. <laughs> and behind us, we've got all of these uh, boxes. Um, a lot of our storage is in boxes um, and we have these wooden boxes in what you'll see is a modular system. So each of our shelves, this is sort of a standard shelf compartment and we have um, a system that was designed especially for the museum that uh, has this modular system that allows us to fit different sized and shaped objects within a box together. Um, wooden boxes is not the ideal, I don't know if any of you will have heard of off-gassing um, but essentially the uh, wood um, creates gases that can damage objects, so we have to find different ways of packing to deal with that. And you'll also see down on the bottom shelf here, we have some open storage. So we've got larger archaeological um, objects, pieces of stone, pieces of buildings, and sometimes we find it easier to store them on what we call open storage, which is basically on display. During the, the first sort of stages of returning to work after lockdown, so we had to stay two metres apart. So we've all got lots of space, which actually turns out to be super handy. Um, <laughs> and you'll see an object that we found today, which is super incredible. This is a, a gourd ball from Tanzania, and it's carved with all these tiny little animals, including a baby goat, <laughs> which is just <laughs> the most beautiful thing that most of us have ever seen. It's, it's got so much life, um, and yeah, it's just the kind of things that we, we find every single day that weren't photographed and are now available to see on the online catalog, which is, yeah, what we're trying to do. Yeah, I'll take you down this way. So on the right here, you've got all of the workstations. Some of the objects that we've been working on in the past couple of days are on the shelves. Um, and on the left here, we've got a large open space, which is, um, it used to be shelving all the way out to where I'm standing, essentially. 
um, to mirror the both, both sides. Uh, but that's been dismantled because we've emptied them. And as you can see in the middle here, we've got some pallets. Uh, this is how we move our objects. So we stack up pallets like this once the boxes have been packed for transport. So that means that the objects inside them can't move around too much, they can't break, they can't damage each other. Um, and then in order to again have another layer of not moving things, we wrap them up in plastic. Would you like to point out our plastic <laughs> saving measures? <laughs> um, our brilliant new workshop technician has come up with a strategy to reduce the amount of plastic we use here, which we'd all been really anxious about for a really long time. Um, so now we're using these, this big roll of plastic strapping um, and then we can actually fix the boxes really, really securely now um, without needing to entirely cling film the entire, the entire stack. Um, and then they'll just have a little weatherproof blanket that can be reused. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that. <laughs> It also makes a difference to the noise because as you can imagine pulling shrink wrap around large pallets is quite noisy. <laughs> <laughs> so over here in the shelving we've again got boxes that have been processed. You'll notice that some of them are packed up in plastic. This is because they're going to go to the freezer or they've been sealed. Um, the rest of them are open and then they'll be put on pallets and moved on one of our move days. to our textile store. Um, we have a specific textile store, not for any specific reason, other than that the textiles need to be stored in a very particular way so that they don't crease. Um, so the vast majority of our textiles are stored on these long tubes. There's a cardboard tube inside there, and then layers of tissue paper. They're rolled really, really carefully, trying to keep a really even pressure. Um, and then they're wrapped in this Tyvek coating, which is sort of waterproof, keeps them safe from dust, tries to protect them from pests. Um, and yeah, this is, this is the room where we can store them in this way. Um, I can show you a few of the other ways that we store textiles down here. Um, so this is a bespoke box um, designed specifically for this object, which is a very, very incredible poncho um, from Peru. It's about a thousand years old um, and these, the preservation of the feathers is just incredible and you can see that they're, they're in this bird design. I think it might be some kind of owl. Um, it's got feathers from loads of different kinds of birds and the, yeah, the way it's stored here is trying to preserve the shape, keep it safe from pests and um, yeah, make sure that it can eventually travel to the new centre of material culture in one piece. Um, so here we've got its roller racking, which um, yeah, can be really slow. <laughs> uh, and it's one of the one of the reasons why this is where we keep the textiles is because this method of storage only works in this one room. They're surprisingly heavy, but right down at this end is where we keep the Arctic parkas. Um, so these are made, they're still made today, um, they're made from sea mammal intestines that are dried in strips and I was just learning today that the temperature that they're dried at affects the opacity and also the flexibility. So if you dry them in hotter weather they'll be paler and also more rigid. Um, and yeah, so this is one such parka used for, it's a kayaking dress um, and they're yeah, really amazing at keeping you warm and dry Ooh. whilst also make, making really good use of the resources available. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a look at some of the large objects in storage. Great. <laughs> Over to me again. Yes. <laughs> so we were going to look uh, under here. So again, a large hangar space. Um, and we've split it up so that we can store more stuff. We've got a mezzanine. And underneath it, we've got this storage space for larger objects. So they're kind of rammed in in the best way we could find. Um, so you'll see here that there's a whole jumble of different objects from different parts of the world. But it does allow us to store these larger objects that won't fit in boxes, they won't fit on shelves. Um, not even on top of the shelves where we've got the shield. Um, and also, if you look over to this side, 
we've got these uh, what we call A-frames. So basically, there are two wooden boards that um, lean against each other at the top. And Lily will pull the curtain aside <laughs> to show you that these are actually um, casts. So they're plaster casts um, of Guatemalan stonework. And they are Mayan. Um, sorry. Uh, and a lot of these are pictographs, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're writing. And we have an awful lot. As you can see, all of this uh, white sheet covered uh, material is like this. And there are actually uh, four of these casts on display in the museum in various galleries. They were donated to us by uh, someone called Monsley, and that's actually who one of the galleries is named after. These are presenting a really big challenge at the moment, because obviously they're super large, they're super heavy, they're really, really fragile, and we've just discovered that also the paint contains some lead. So we will be getting specialist movers in to, yeah, to really move these super carefully. And you'll see the, where they're gonna be stored the second life store tour next week. Yeah. yeah. But before we do that, but how do you guys move these objects? Over? That's a good point. So Lily just kind of uh, hinted at specialist movers. Um, a lot of this stuff is too heavy for us to move. Um, it's too heavy for one person to move or even a couple of us together. Uh, we do have um, pallet trucks that we use ourselves, but even this is too much for that. So we'll get a specialist art shipper in who will pack them up. We'll process them first. Um, and then they'll pack them up for us. So again, the padding, um, and then go on to a lorry and be taken to the CMC for us. And as Lily said, you'll see that on Wednesday. So I'm gonna take you upstairs, show you the mezzanine. So up here, I wanted to mention a couple of things that are challenging for us in terms of the storage. Um, I already mentioned that to fit more things in, we've got this mezzanine, um, but the building is not working with us. So we have these lovely beams <laughs> that go all the way across um, that actually we have to duck under, I'm afraid. There's no, um, there's no easy way around it. Um, I wanted to show you again, we've got some open storage down here where we've got some lovely pottery. Um, I will be honest and say I don't know where a lot of it is from. Some of it is Egyptian, sort of North African. Um, I know this lovely red piece here is going to be South American, this one here, and it's got a lovely little detail there. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that just goes all the way down. It does go all the way down under the sloping ceiling as yes. well. Yes. So <laughs> height issues. <laughs> And I should actually say that all of this white sheet, again on the top, Tyvek, um, is to prevent any little water drips from the ceiling because the building is quite old. I should have said earlier that um, it was supposed to be temporary storage in the 70s for us. So we've been here for a long time and we're really desperate to move somewhere else. <laughs> so I'll take you down this way. So again, you've got the same kind of setup with the aisles. Um, these shelves are double depth, which is challenging for us if we have regular size boxes because they stack all the way inside. But as you can see here, we've got extra long boxes. Um, and that's generally to accommodate things like staffs, swords, uh, quivers, um, sometimes arrows, it's just things that we need extra length for. Um, and actually you can see some of these that have already been processed here. These are bows, and again, this is temporary storage where we're just storing them layered up on top of each other because we have so many. <laughs> so how many objects are you moving in this store? Um, so we estimated at the beginning of the project that there are around 250,000 objects in this store. Um, I think it's likely to be quite a bit more than that, and as we're finding... Um, with the records while we're working on them, we do split a lot of them. So basically what looks like one record actually belongs to five objects, let's say, and then we'll end up with five different records. So the total number of objects that we move, I couldn't even guess that, I'm afraid. Right. <laughs> so I wanted to show you down here, again, we've got long objects, and these are all things that are unprocessed so far. Um, so we've got, again, paddles, bows, um, and we're trying to kind of get a sense of where everything is from, all of these um, bays would have been completely full when we started. And behind me here are some of the cases that some of these objects came in. Um, as you can see, 
this one sort of labeled South Sudan. Um, some objects will have come to us in these cases, possibly collected and put directly in these cases and sent to the museum. And since then they've been used as temporary storage. No objects are stored in these anymore, but they are part of the museum's history. And um, it's interesting to kind of think that these objects, they aren't objects in the sense of a museum object because they're not accessioned. Because what accessioning means is that the object, uh, sorry, the museum has promised to look after this object in perpetuity. So legally we are responsible for objects that we have accessioned. And we have not accessioned these because we don't see them in the same light as objects. But are they? You know, should they be objects? Um, so we're kind of in discussions about what to do with things like this. But they are really cool looking. They this are really very yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a nice label on the one at the top there. I don't know if you can catch the detail on that. Just about. Just about. <laughs> I really love that kind of old handwriting. First standing, they're amazing. All right, so cool. we'll take you back downstairs, and what we get to do now is go into the workroom. Great. Where someone's going to take you through the process of uh, processing objects. Cool. And if any of our viewers have any questions for you guys, then just pop them in the comments and yeah, we'll get back to them. We will try. To <laughs> we'll <your> try. <laughs> so I'll pass you over to Hi there, guys. Welcome to the workroom. I'm going to talk you through a bit about how we actually um, do our kind of working process and how we unbox and look after the collection and help kind of move everything to the new building. So here I have a box from Zambia. I'm going to do a little unboxing. So I'll just put the lid to one side. Mm -hmm. So often we're not entirely sure what we might find in the box. And that's part of the real excitement. And then we get to kind of care and look after the collections. So actually, these objects, I'll take them out carefully now. I'm wearing gloves and we make sure that we kind of test the object to see what it's comfortable with before handling them. And I'll put them on the desk. And we've got the second mask here. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're fascinating, aren't they? They They're are great. really exciting objects. So I actually looked up in the database. That would be the first thing we did when we get the objects out. We look up in the database and see what information the museum really has about them. Um, for these ones, I've looked at them earlier, and they're actually from the city of Livingston in Zambia. And uh, they were collected by a previous uh, museum director, Professor um, David Phillipson, and he gave them to the museum in 2006. We actually know that these are replicas, so he bought them in um, some tourist shops and from travelling salespeople in kind of the 1960s and 70s and some of the 90s as well. And they're actually replicas of really amazing masks that are used and kind of represent um, the Makishi, which are the spiritual ancestors of the Luvali people, and they're used in a Makanda initiation ceremony, which is kind of when boys become men. So these are tiny versions of what would have actually been much bigger, bigger masks. In fact, this hyena one would have actually been so big that you could wear it on your whole body and kind of be underneath it. So it's really oh exciting gosh. to see them out. When we're um, processing objects, the first thing we do is look for labels. I've actually got a nice example here of something you might find, which is a 1910 label from another object. So you can see part of the problem can be deciphering handwriting, seeing what information we have, because we want to make sure the object provenance is known and we get as much detail as possible. The other thing we can look at is um, object catalogue cards. This is another example of some <laughs> potentially difficult to read handwriting. <laughs> um, and so we have a selection of these that have now actually been digitised, which is really helping us kind of make a lot more easy progress with the work. And another thing I'll quickly show you is also the accession register. So this has also been digitised, but you can see everything that's coming into the museum and entering the museum's collection is written out. And now we have both paper copies and digital copies as well, which help give us as much information as possible about the object. So our work is to try and make these objects visible. So we'll write a kind of physical description about them 
uh, and then we'll measure them to try and give people a sense. Because if you saw it on a photo, <laughs> you might not know how big it is. If you thought this was actually the original mask, you might think, oh, it's huge. Mm. Um, and then after that, we will think about the object material type. Mm -hmm. Are there any kind of worries you might have about storage, such as um, pests or insect activity? Um, any potential hazards? So is your object made of something that's going to degrade like plastic? Is it potentially made of something that many years ago everyone thought was fine, but now is deemed poisonous, like mercury? Um, and we'll flag those on our database so that anyone handling them, including researchers and visitors, know that there's a potential hazard. Um, yeah, so I'll show you guys our conservation area. We um, have the amazing help of Dr. Aisha Fuentes, um, who works in conservation, and she's left out a few of her tools actually. So a lot of issues that we have with the collection is because they're made from a lot of natural materials and natural materials are the tastiest thing possible to pests. <laughs> so over here, this is one that I just recently worked on. It's actually an ostrich feather headdress from Kenya. Um, and we found that there are a lot of things like moth casings, um, kind of frass, which is actually called what we call pest poop, um, left behind on the objects. And obviously that's not how it was intended to be. So we really want to make sure we can try and clean them and take good care of them for the future as well. So Aisha's left me a few tools. We've got the museum back here, which is a bit like your, your vacuum at home, but a bit more kind of sensitive and we can really control the settings. Also got some little tweezers and some kind of inert wood just used to kind of, you know, wiggle out some little insect debris or maybe take off a label that doesn't need to be there. We've got a little sponge for cleaning things. You can see it's been used. <laughs> and then we also have some lovely brushes. And actually brushes are really good because you can choose how soft or how kind of, um, I can't feel the word, <laughs> how dense you want them to be. Um, and that's really nice for like brushing off dust. Uh, this is actually made from goat's hair. So once we've made sure we've cleaned an object and we've got all the information we know about an object for the description, it's then time to photograph the object. So this is another amazing mask from Zambia, actually collected at the same time and given to the museum in 2006. It's another replica from um, the Lakishi ceremony and it's a really interesting object. We stage them carefully, get the lighting right, we also put in the museum accession number so that anyone who kind of wants to know more information can find that on the database. The really important thing about taking photographs is not only to make sure we have a record of the object condition, but also to increase access and visibility. So if we take photos, they're the quickest thing to kind of share with people around the world and to get excited about the objects, to reach out if they know information about the objects. Um, the final stage after we photograph them is packing. So today I've been working on some poison arrows from Kenya which have a lot of packing considerations, I would say. So for instance, these ones, we very carefully, I'm just turning it the right way, <laughs> see the little poison I've added on. Um, very important. We carefully <laughs> wrap them in um, acid-free tissue paper and we make sure that the points are also safe for anyone coming to handle them in the future. Um, if they're poisonous, we'll also bag them in an inert plastic that's conservation safe. Um, just to make sure that anyone coming to handle them in the future, any kind of cultural groups, any researchers, any visitors, know what they're dealing with and what they're picking up. Um, underneath this, we've got another layer. So we've got some squidgy jiffy, which may look familiar to some of you guys um, who, you know, if it gets me in the post. Um, we use and make sure things are inert and conservation grade. I've got some quivers that I've carefully packed, making sure that they don't touch each other. And this is actually more acid-free um, tissue paper. We make these little things called puffs, which are very fun to make. And actually, I would recommend if you have a moving house, you can make them yourself. <laughs> it's basically kind of a carefully folded up piece of tissue paper that acts as a little cushion to help buffer against any movement in transport um, and make sure the objects don't roll around or touch each other, just to keep them safe. So, as we said at the start, there are nine collection assistants. This is what we're working on every single day, and the aim is to take them safely over to the material, the Centre for Material Culture, at the new site. And then we really hope there'll be more access and we can kind of celebrate these objects and get more people to come and see them. Great. Thanks, <laughs> And if anyone does want to um, search our collections website, it's online at collections.maa.org.
dot com yeah. dot ac dot uk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, quick question. Yeah, I'm still asking you. Absolutely. What is it like touching an object at the end? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I think it's really beautiful. It's massive. I've been mesmerised by it. I think you always feel so incredibly privileged to be able to be near them, and you get such a sense of the incredible craftsmanship Mm. and skill behind them. Um, You know, it's a real kind of interesting and, and close connection to be able to be kind of holding and working with an object um yeah and especially because we write physical descriptions of them you really start to look at the, the details really closely and notice things you might not see them straight away so yeah it's really rewarding seems absolutely i absolutely adore it um, <laughs> but the team here is absolutely lovely all of them work super hard and as you said all the objects that we've seen today and some of others you can actually find on our website too um, but with all these objects, and speaking, we'll go back now to the yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um So what was those objects made of? Uh, so actually, I can show you. Um, the hyena replica, we've got some uh, plant fiber string, and then we've got a basketry framework, and then it's been coated with kind of organic matter, possibly mud, uh, and then once that's dried, it's been painted with pigment as well. So it's got a lot of kind of like natural materials that actually we have to think about how we can look after them long term. So are they quite light? This one's really light actually, yeah, which is lovely. Um, sometimes objects take you by surprise and they're worse than you expect, so you always have to be on your guard to make sure you them. And other times they're much heavier than you think, so it's always really interesting. That's great. So when you don't have information, because mm-hmm. obviously we all don't have to actually can't get everything, so what do you do when you don't have yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, um, no one can be an expert at every object around the world. So we are really looking for people to kind of, you know, um, share with us once we digitise these collections. We want to hear from people. Um, we would first kind of reach out to um, other museums, um, to our internal curators. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, there are some objects we just don't have that much about. And we really do want to know more about them. So people kind of look on the website and you think, I know that, I lived with that object, I've interacted with that object. Get in touch, we'd love to hear. Okay, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we've got any questions actually? Um, we have a comment from Candy who says that many years ago this was her first job in oh, 1972, yeah. which is great. <laughs> <laughs> All the generations that have worked here. Um, I had a question as well. I was wondering what the most challenging or interesting objects that you've personally worked on is. Put you on the spot now. <laughs> 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 so kind of think, hmm, how am I going to approach this? Uh, but because we're in a team, it's actually really nice to kind of bounce you know, ideas off each other and kind of work collaboratively to figure out how to kind of problem solve something that might just be like the sheer physical size of an object. Mm. I think one of the, the most interesting challenges are those objects that we don't know anything about. Um, trying to really set them up to have a future where people can engage with them, where they're chosen for displays, where they, yeah, where they get reunited with their, their source communities or the, the people who know something about them. Um, yeah, trying to give them that, that start that they haven't had so far. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a specific object in mind, but I think one of the things for me, the biggest challenge is objects that are really, really delicate and really friable. And it's partly because they were never designed to last this long. Um, so I'm thinking particularly things that do have plant fiber in them. And sometimes they're in um, a really, sad state actually where you can barely pick it up without damaging it so the question then becomes how do i interact with this object how can i find as much information out about it without manipulating it too much and then um, how can i pack it in a way that it will hopefully last for the same amount of time again Um, and that becomes quite challenging and that's when we would often speak to the conservator that we have often uh, working with us um, and kind of say how can i do better by this object and then we would use specialist materials. Like I don't know if you mentioned relic wrap. Yeah. And it's a really smooth material um, that basically will stop anything catching on it. So if you've got plant fibers, you can um, create a little cradle basically with relic wrap. Great. Awesome. <laughs> We've got a few other questions for you guys. Put you all on the spot. <laughs> um, so, what made you guys work here? <laughs> 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 Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's really wanting to see 
increase access to collections. Sometimes museums can feel like institutions that are either elitist or kind of alienating. So actually kind of hoping to digitize and to kind of make the collections more egalitarian so it's not just kind of people who have the behind the scenes knowledge already, that everyone has access to them. And we're really hoping that with this project that would be a kind of um, like a key kind of achievement hopefully, that we'll have a lot more visibility to our collections and that we can get loads of different people all over around the world actually because it's on the internet, you know, it's great to share. So yeah, I think getting involved in some good accessibility and increasing the visibility of the objects because they deserve it. Great. I'll put you back on the spot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things for me is um, what's always been important is the blend of practical and academic. Um, so the idea of being able to look at objects from different countries that are made in very different ways to practices that we might be more familiar with um, and having that chance to learn from the objects um, that's what's really exciting to me. Um, I do beadwork and I love to examine different pieces of beadwork and work on it, sort of how it was done, what kind of thread was used, whether they used a needle or not. Um, and that's kind of been weaving through my life. So I actually started out studying engineering. <laughs> and some people say, well, how did you end up in the museum? Um, and it's, it's interesting because I think they do blend those two sort of, sorry, engineering and archaeology, anthropology, they blend those two aspects of practicality with the academic um, and then you can take that further on into your own life so when I'm making something I can sort of lean on or borrow ideas from different objects that I've seen. Great. For me it's the fact that I was always going to work in a museum probably just because of who I am as a person and you know when you're a five-year-old kid and you see something and you talk about it for a year and your parents are like they're proud of it and I never got out of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, it's the, it's the fact that this museum has, it, it's literally a museum of thousands and thousands of years of human beings doing things and being amazing and having ideas. Um, try it, search, search a colour and a, an object, any object you can think of, like a yellow umbrella, we've got them. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's that, that opportunity to see human beings being human beings in every possible way that you can, you can imagine. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a real privilege. Okay. I mean, as I said earlier, I was working on poison arrows today, so that's kind of um, more cautious around hazards and uh, making sure everyone around me is safe and I'm safe. Um, but then the next day I might be working on something incredibly fine and delicate, like a, a textile that's kind of, you know, in quite a fragile state. So it's, it's really very, which makes it really exciting. Um, and yeah, getting to be so close with the objects, you kind of feel like you're learning something each day. Yeah, it's the same really, it's the variation, um, and that's something that I absolutely thrive on. I would hate to have to do the same thing every day. And while we are doing the same thing in terms of we are processing objects, um, the variety of objects that we have really brings the pleasure into that. Um, one of the things that uh, is quite interesting is that a lot of the packing that we have, um, which has been implemented over previous years, things have been organised by uh, geographical region, often by country, um, but also by type. So we've got boxes that are just full of baskets, boxes that are just full of uh, wooden pots. Um, but there are still some, um, some boxes that haven't been regimented in this fashion, and they're the most exciting ones, because you open a box and you think, oh, right, okay, we've got some rings here, some finger rings. And, and then you go further down the layers and you go, oh, we've got a mask as well. And then further down, oh, we've got a pot. So the kind of the variety that comes through and the surprise in it. Every sort of layer you peel back is something different. Okay. Yeah, I actually opened one of those at 4pm today. So I'm going to for tomorrow morning. Yeah. yeah. So the box that I opened, it was, it was one of those, those boxes that hasn't been organised into type. It had a cone, it had a sheath, it had a musical instrument, a knife, one singular sandal, <laughs> and, um, a trough, and a load of what would you look at that? <laughs> so they'll be going back into separate boxes with objects that have compatible materials and types so that when people want to look at all of the tobacco pipes from Tanzania, they'll be able to do it more easily. But it is, it is fun to see the things that have been living together in their boxes for 50 years and wonder about what kind of conversations they've been having. <laughs> <laughs> we have
have had a question from Lucy. What's the most surprising material that you've come across in the collections? Surprising material? Surprising oh. material. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Then, uh, where's it from? I think Europe. Europe, Europe is European. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we we opened a drawer, and there was a label, and it said cheese horse, and we were like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then started digging through the layers of tissue, and inside, lo and behold, there was a horse <laughs> made of cheese, and it was yeah, it was incredible. Everyone still talks about the cheese horse. Um, yeah. Where, where was that from? It, I think it was it was from the, the folklore cabinets, which are it was an old display case that was in the museum with a range of different objects from around Europe, um, and yeah, it was one of those, and it hasn't been looked at since being taken off display, and now it's nicely packed up somewhere for someone to work out exactly where it's from and what kind of cheese it is. Awesome. And you can find that on our website. You can absolutely <laughs> find it on our website. And maybe it says where it's from. I can't remember. There's another cheese horse in Yeah. It's like a yellow umbrella. Um, there was a question, does the collections have 3D models for the visitors to see virtually? Um, I think there are a few that have been created. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think there is, there is a handling collection within the museum. Yeah. Uh, this is not my area of expertise. So I'm just <laughs> aware that there is a handling collection that is used by the uh, learning team, um, which are object, they are re real objects, just the way that everything else is a real object, but they have been set aside to be used in scenarios where people can touch them. Um, and actually, I think that's a really, a really good way to use objects. Um, and I think you learn a lot of different things from touching the object, especially with your bare hands. Um, there are things that you cannot pick up on from a photograph site. Um, and actually, the photographs that we're putting on the website are great. Um, I'll say that myself. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't give you a full sense of the object. They don't give you the, the tactile sensation. They don't give you a particularly accurate impression of size or depth. Um, and they don't give you the things like smells, which sometimes when we open a box, we wish we also weren't getting. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. We, yeah, us at the educational team, we do have some of the objects you guys are kind of giving to us. <laughs> but yeah, it definitely does help with learning. I know I enjoy touching objects as well. So mm -hmm. hey, it's a little win win situation for everyone. But um, ooh, is there any more questions? No, I don't think so. Um, the interesting question of like, how did all the objects get on the That's one that requires a, a shortened answer. There is obviously a much longer answer. So a lot of the objects that are in the museum were donated to us. Um, a lot of them were donated, uh, collected and donated by people who are uh, connected somehow with the university or with the museum itself. So we will have objects from previous curators, we will have objects from um, anthropology professors, people who have traveled in these countries and, and collected uh, a large, large <laughs> amount of objects. Um, some others have been bought, so more recently there's been very few acquisitions, but there are sometimes acquisitions that are of particular note and um, sit particularly well within the museum's collections. Uh, as to how the people who donated the objects to us got them, that's always a very varied story and something that we are actively trying to make sure gets looked into a bit more, why they had them in their possession, why they had so many of them, whether they purchased them, whether they purchased them at a fair price, or whether they just took them, because that is absolutely the case sometimes. This is um, really what we want to do actually by kind of um, opening up the collections and getting a lot more kind of access to the you know the, the data and the documentation behind it. We're looking to try and find the provenance, and we want to kind of address those histories and actually look into them. And we're very open to repatriation as a museum, so you know there are, there are some objects that definitely have worked into those discussions. Great. Awesome. Um, <laughs> gosh, what time are we at now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, let's see, um, let, let anyone know if there's, it's watching, what's some top tips on how to become a collections assistant. Okay, this is an awesome world of like, touching objects and finding <laughs> the most interesting and the awkward things mm -hmm. inside. What top tips would you give them? I think the cool thing is that we we all have really different backgrounds, yeah. and all you actually essentially need is a passion for it. 
um, a witness to yeah, spend your life taking care of things. <laughs> I would say enthusiasm goes a long way. Like you're happy in some of my previous jobs, it's like you're gonna spend the whole day cleaning objects and that means getting covered in mould and dust, <laughs> but you can keep a smile and you're enthusiastic and you, you stay positive about stuff and actually I think that, that rubs off on people and they can see that you really do care and uh, people kind of remember that. So kind of being enthusiastic about, about the work is what's really important. Mm. I think one of the other top tips would be to um, try to volunteer if you can. I know that's the line that always gets plugged and it's very annoying when you're trying to uh, buy enough food to eat, um, <laughs> but it really, really helps having the experience with collections, uh, showing yourself to be someone who is enthusiastic, like the other two have said, um, and giving you the confidence to move forward with that. Um, I think all of us, nearly all of us, have volunteered with museum collections. Um, and it, I mean, you learn a lot from doing it anyway, even for yourself. So, thank you very much. I hope those tips were very useful. I kind of they were for your job. Um, but I think we're going to round up there. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for letting us come behind the scenes. I know I've definitely enjoyed it, and I'm pretty sure everyone watching has enjoyed it too. You guys have seen some of the amazing work that these te this team does here. Are you going to catch us Wednesday for the next part to see where they're moving all this great stuff to? and to see more of the amazing work they're up to. So thank you guys for watching and joining us today and we'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>